And on behalf of the center and our dean, Dr. David Richard, I welcome you to this, the second of our health care forum series for 2015. This evening, I'm also proud to announce that we've partnered with the Winter Park Health Foundation for the entire 2015 Health Forum series. So we're glad to have them, and they've been an integral part of what we're doing here <laughs> in the health center. There you go. And then you can take that back. We have one of the members of the foundation here, and don't tell them I paid you to do that. <laughs> um, tonight, our topic is heart healthy across the ages. How do we look at the mystery of heart disease, a serious public health issue and a leading cause of death in America? What can we do about the risk factors and what strategies can we affect to reduce its impact on the general health and well-being of the community as well as the individual? We're going to talk about that tonight. We've gathered a group of three individuals who are intimately qualified to speak to these issues and after brief presentations we'll open up the floor to questions submitted by you on some three by five cards. Staff will be going around and passing out the cards. Those of you who have an interesting question to ask based upon the presentations, they'll be collected later, and then we'll have a nice dis discussion and a panel forum up front um, for responses to your questions. In order to facilitate our endeavor here tonight, I will introduce each of the speakers just before their presentation, and then we'll have them again sent up front as a panel. You also have a brief biography in your handouts. Some of you have handouts from out front that you can take a look at. Okay, so here we go. Our first presenter tonight is Dr. Kevin Akala. Dr. Akala, and the ambulance has arrived just in time, Dr. Akala. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to go, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Akala received his medical degree from the University of Illinois School of Medicine and received his residency training in general surgery with Dr. DeBakey in Houston and in cardiothoracic surgery under Dr. Guyton at Emory University in Atlanta. In addition to being the managing partner of one of the busiest cardiovascular surgical groups in the southeastern United States, he is a member of and devotes much of his time to many state and national surgical societies. Dr. Eccolo is well published, lectures at the national and international level, and is a YouTube video star, which I learned after I Googled your name. <laughs> and is the founder of the Center of Excellence for Heart Valve Surgery and the training program at Florida Hospital. Please, what, please welcome Dr. Kevin Ackler. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. It's a privilege to be here. I'm not a podium speaker, so if you don't mind, uh, I feel more comfortable just out here amongst you, if that's okay. So uh, this is a neat thing, I think, what they're developed here, and it's, it's an ongoing uh, entity I think is going to be real exciting not only for us in healthcare but that we get an opportunity to share things with you but also as an opportunity for you to learn things and pick up uh, more information not only what to do and the, the two speakers to follow me are going to describe in more detail what not to do so I was going to say if I was going last to be the good and the bad and now the ugly well I'm going to show the <laughs> ugly I'm going to show what happens to you when you don't necessarily uh, follow what the next two speakers are going to talk about, as well as uh, what I'd like to emphasize a little bit tonight is some of the new technologies, which are fascinating, and in all of your times, uh, young and elderly alike are going to see immense changes in technology, not only for, for the, the ideas in mind what not to do, health conscious, uh, health conscious diets, but also, in the, in the obvious, of course, what not to do, but also as natural disease processes occur as we all age, some of the new technologies to treat those. So I'm going to show some videos of surgery, so if you're squeamish, I'll tell you, and I can just close your eyes, but it's nothing too bad. Uh, the patients all did fine, we'll just say that. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, let's... Uh, Go on again, a privilege to be here tonight. New innovations in cardiac surgery. I'm going to talk a little bit over the next 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes about valve technologies, bioprosthetic valves, which are tissue valves, most commonly from uh, the sac around a cow's heart called a pericardial valve or a, an actual pig valve, a porcine valve, or mechanical valves, which are made out of a carbon pyrolytic product. The same product actually is on, on the bottom of the space shuttles made into valve discs very durable as well as quiet and long-lasting. Also, I'm going to talk to, about some new approaches to standardized valve procedures, the future of valve surgery, kind of where we're going with technology and hybrid operating rooms in regards to new technologies to place valves, uh, catheter-based delivery systems or TAVAR, transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. We'll touch a little bit on coronary artery disease. I'll show you a little bit of what that looks like. 
So as they're d discussing the, the pros and cons of, of health, heart healthy diets and activity and lifestyles, you'll see if it's not done, kind of what that looks like or what the potential could be. And then uh, I think in the discussion we'll review some of the future considerations. But there's a lot of changes in patient population. There's a greater number of women. I think it's more because there's a, a more uh, attention to women's uh, health disease and certainly in, in regards to heart healthy disease. Patients are older, no question, but the older patients that are coming to us now are much more active. They want to know when they can get back to playing golf, when they can, the, the octogenarians, the nanogenarians, when they can travel again, when they can make that cruise. And they're also very motivated to get better. Tell me what I have to do, I'll do it because I want to get back to doing what I enjoy doing. Uh, critical uh, um, patients uh, with more comorbidities, patients also as they get older have a lot more other comorbidities which the other speakers will discuss some of the things to avoid those comorbidities, but whether it's diabetes or renal disease or obesity or s previous smoking history with lung injury, those are some of the things that we see particularly in older patients that make uh, their care more complicated. Increased number of redo operations, patients who would had operations before, more complex cases and procedures. But I think the most important thing, and much like why we are here tonight, because of these types of forums provide more information for patients uh, and they become more participants, not only in their choices to avoid surgery or to avoid adverse events of poor health, but to make their health better. So it's interesting, uh, in 1982, only 1.6% 1 of the population was over a, uh, age 65. And uh, 2030, which sounds like a long ways from now, but in actuality it's not as, as it's only 15 years from now, the population is going to be 21% or 1 in 5 people will be over the age of 65. So again, very important as we all age. Another article, uh, of course, uh, one of the scientific journals here, USA Today Snapshots. If you look at projected increase in uh, age uh, 65 and older, uh, a population between 2000 and 2050, again a 50 year span, the projected U.S. population is uh, uh, supposed to increase by 49 percent, but those patients, or those people, so I'm sorry, I'll, I'm going to interchange patients and people quite often, I apologize for that, uh, are projected to go up to 147 uh, percent of uh, increase in that population. So again, patients uh, are continuing to become older, but yet more healthy as they age. Some of the changes in patient focus and perspective, I think they're making more increased demands and increased expectations. They want to have a, a smaller incision, a, a quicker operation so they can get in and out of the hospital and get back to their activities. Uh, more public information, again, like what's being dis discussed this evening. More informed patients uh, with the internet. The internet is huge, and I tell people not to become too involved in that because you can become super saturated with information and oftentimes becomes burdensome with these patients. Uh, the patients are looking for a greater level of satisfaction. Again, they want to get back to their activities quicker. They desire also to avoid lifelong medications whether they go with some type of holistic medication or whether they change their lifestyle or their diet to create a circumstance where they don't need medications. They're very not only interested in this but very motivated to do this. But they're also most of all looking for state-of-the-art techniques uh, to improve uh, their circumstances. This doesn't show up very well. It looks like it's a little yellow but anticoagulation issues, particularly in my circumstance, about 80-85% of my practice is valve surgery, whether it's valve repair or valve replacement. Patients want to avoid anticoagulation or Coumadin. Uh, the mechanical valve, as we uh, discussed earlier, uh, lasts forever, but with the carbon pyrolytic products and moving parts, it requires anticoagulation or a blood thinner, Coumadin. Uh, the tissue valves do not require Coumadin, but they don't have the longevity that the mechanical valves have. So it's always a trade-off determining whether a patient wants to be on anticoagulation with a valve that lasts forever, or maybe a valve they might have to have replaced at some point. But there's still hope for these patients too because I'm going to show some technology in a moment where we may be able to place a valve inside these valves as these valves begin to deteriorate or structurally uh, do not work as well. 
So there's been a huge paradigm shift from my time uh, back with Dr. DeBakey over the last 30 years of training and, and practice. I've been here in, in Orlando 23 years now. And the operating room is oftentimes a very sterile, quiet environment. Everybody's focused on the incision. We have a perfusionist and a nurse and an assistant, uh, a first assistant and an anesthesia. It's somewhat of a quiet, sedate circumstance. Well, now oftentimes we're doing these new procedures, the new technology procedures, uh, in a, what's called a hybrid room. So this is a room that could be a cath lab. The cardiologist can do catheterization procedures, or we can do procedures with, a, with wire technologies, or it can quickly turn into an operating room if necessary because we have the same type of, of, of mechanics and things within this room that we can do a regular operation. So we use our hybrid room to both do open cardiac procedures as well as percutaneous or wire-based procedures. But look at now, it's a cardio, this is myself, and this is one of our cardiologists, Andy Tausig, another one, Jose Arias. This is my TAVAR team, which we, we uh, perform the percutaneous valves. This is one of my colleagues, uh, Jorge Suarez, one of my partners. Now we have an OR person standing next to a cath lab person, and everybody's working simultaneous. So from a surgical and cardiology perspective, it's taken a paradigm shift to do this in a collegial manner, but yet we teach each other different mechanisms of, of techniques that, that they've been doing, for Andy's been doing for, for almost 30 years, or I've been doing for about 28 years, with, from a surgical-based or from a cardiology-based manner, how to, to take care of these patients. And again, this involves some of the newer technologies. But look, at a moment ago I showed you, everybody's looking at the wound, it's quiet. Well now, no one's looking at the patient even, we're all looking at screens. So again, it's been a paradigm shift for us, particularly for the surgeons, because we're used to, to looking at a wound and taking care of where, what's right in front of us. Now we see a more dynamic process occurring before us uh, on, the, on the television screens. And the number of people involved in all of these procedures, here's uh, Tausig, myself again, and, and uh, Arius is behind him, but we have cath lab people, industry people, we have people that are running the, the uh, cath lab table, and, and, and doing all the monitoring on, in this other room on the other side of this glass. So it takes an enormous amount of people with these new technologies. Now, will some of that improve? Yes, it will, but again, the, the newer technologies, because of the collegial effort between a surgical service and a cardiology service, is going to require more people. I'm going to talk a little bit about aortic valve stenosis. I'm sorry these slides that look like everything is yellow. Does it look yellow? It looks yellow to me. <coughs> Yeah, green. We're going green. Uh, so the aortic valve stenosis, I'm going to talk about a bit, little bit. The aortic valve is the main valve from the left heart, the left ventricle, out uh, the aorta. And it's a, it's a degenerative process as we age. The good news is if you age long enough to get aortic stenosis, you've gotten older. Bad news is if you don't age long enough, then it doesn't matter. But regardless of what uh, you, know, you do from either a dietary standpoint or, um, or a, uh, a health conscientious, conscientious standpoint, this is a sclerotic process that occurs with aging. And as the valve becomes sclerotic or calcified, it get, becomes stenotic, so it doesn't open or close normally to let the same amount of blood go out the ventricle as it would if it was totally open. The history of valves, this was the Star Edwards valve back in the 1960s, and as these have progressed, there's been a huge number of advances. Anywhere from 130 to 150 valves have come across the market to the point where, again, we use the porcine valve or the pericardial valve, or these are the two mechanical valves which are most often utilized. So what is it that's different with what we're doing with our current valve uh, products that we have now? Well, we're making minimally, uh, I hate to use the word minimally invasive. I've been at, uh, at uh, open forums such as this, and I said, well, what's minimally invasive mean? And some will say, well, it's less risk. No, it's the same risk, because you're still doing heart surgery. Uh, so I hate to use the, the word minimally invasive, because it sounds like it, de it decreases the risk, when in actuality it still is uh, as risky as it would be if you were doing an open procedure. So I'm going to call it less invasive or limited access or partial sternotomy or percutaneous procedure, which we'll, I'll show a video here momentarily, or non-sternotomy, in other words, not opening the sternum. I put robotics in parentheses because it's still not there yet. 
I think maybe it's because of the technology is so new, but I think uh, one of my uh, previous professors said it's the future of cardiac surgery and always will be. In other words, I, I, it'll, I think it'll be difficult to apply. I think robotics has tried to, to find a, 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 a circumstance to, to be utilized, but I'm not so sure that it's ready for uh, the big time yet. I think with any operation, though, the long-term success of the procedure is most important as opposed to the short-term appearance of the incision or the approach. And this is what I tell my patients when they come in after looking on the internet and wanting to have a particular procedure with a different incision or uh, limited access. So oftentimes we'll use just an upper sternotomy incision instead of an incision down the whole uh, front of the chest and an entire sternotomy. And so we can operate through these quite uh, nicely now because we've gotten adept to operating through smaller incisions. Rarely do we make an incision now this large unless someone needs a lot of bypasses or has something else complex going on. And typically now it's just a hemisternotomy incision where the whole lower two-thirds of the sternum still is remaining intact. And this gentleman's happy to show his, we call it a three-finger incision. So the rest of the sternum is intact. I let these patients drive it two weeks and even get more active uh, at, uh, at uh, four to six weeks as opposed to waiting to, to eight to ten weeks. So where is this all going with valve? Sutureless uh, surgical aortic valve technology, either minimal access surgery is a natural evolution in valve surgery, trending towards non-sternotomy. I'm going to show just a couple examples here quickly of the percutaneous valve technologies or TAVER and then also the rapid deployment valves which fa facilitate the smaller incisions or their alternative incisions uh, that we're now utilizing. So this is just an animation. Again, I'm sorry these have, have all turned out green but uh, um, it's still, uh, this is a, the aortic stenosis. This is simulating the aortic stenosis. You can see the sclerosis of the, the valve itself. So again, this is called a TAVAR procedure or a percutaneous procedure where we're going to place catheters and wires through the groin. The patient is asleep, but we don't use the heart-lung machine. We don't stop the heart. But we have placed a pacing wire in the heart, so we're going to rapidly ventricularly pace the heart as we do uh, the balloon valvuloplasty. The balloon valvuloplasty is necessary because we actually literally crack the valve open uh, with the balloon so that we can, once we place the, the valve inside of the valve, it will stay and, uh, and accommodate a, a now a new tissue valve. So this is the valve now being delivered up into the aorta and goes across the aortic arch. And again, we're going to rapid ventricularly pace the heart so that the heart's not ejecting. The heart can tolerate that for a period of one to two minutes. See, we'll rapidly pace now again. As we're doing that, then we deploy the valve. So that's the TAVAR procedure where we do it transfemorally or through the groin. Uh, this is actually one of our cases. This is what the valve looks like as it's deployed. And as you can see, we're doing the balloon valvuloplasty here. And then at that point, the valve is placed across the native valve and then it is deployed in the appropriate position. And the pacer is turned off and uh, the valve stays where it's supposed to be because of the radial deployment and the pressure from the existing calcium. So the difference is we don't cut out the valve, we just push it all aside and deploy a valve inside the valve. So I mentioned earlier the tissue valves there's a potential at some point that these valves can be placed inside of some of those tissue valves that were placed years ago. So that's called valve and valve. So there's a huge trend where more people, younger people, are accepting tissue valves and the risk of reoperation because of this uh, potential of a valve and valve. Then another uh, a, a new valve, that we're, it's an FDA trial, uh, which we're one of, uh, I think, 14 centers that are doing this trial. Basically, it's the, it's the, the previous uh, proven pericardial technology above, and then the, it's a hybrid of the stented valve, which I just showed, uh, below uh, the sewing ring. And basically, this is another animation, which in this circumstance, like an or a normal valve operation, we actually remove all the valvular tissue. So he said, well, what, what's important about that? Well, if we remove it, then there's less risk of stroke or less risk of those, the, the calcium breaking off and going to the brain. Once we do that, we size that and we place sutures 
three sets of sutures around the annulus. This is kind of the scaffolding of the, the aortic valve. These are then placed through the valve itself. And again, this is a tissue valve or a biologic valve called a pericardial valve. It's actually the sac around a, a cow's heart made into a valve. This is then placed down into the annulus where with a, a balloon and it's, uh, it's deployed. And again, the patient's on the heart-lung machine, so it's really no different than a regular operation. The advantage is, is we can use very small incisions because we don't have to make all the, the, uh, the, the sutures around the annulus and we don't have to tie uh, all of those, uh, those sutures. At that point, then the balloon is expanded or the valve is deployed. And so the area below the valve holds it in place, so we just require three sutures, so it's a, it's a rapid deployment or rapid attachment valve. Mitral valve disease, we've continued to advance there as well. Mitral valve is in the middle of the heart, and you can see it's, it's held by a, core, a series of cords. If one of these cords ruptures, then the valve needs to be uh, repaired most of the time, sometimes requires replacement. But mitral valve repairs is one of my interests as well. We're seeing a lot more patients, even asymptomatic patients, where we see them earlier uh, for repair. Uh, the new technologies that have occurred, we can do echography now. And this is actually, this is Dr. Ed Wilson doing an echo on a patient. You can, I can see the exact 3D uh, reconstruction of the valve. Uh, so I can see exactly where the tear is for the mitral valve repair. And, as you can see, the techniques and approaches, they continue to evolve as well as the imaging technology. This is a, a Barlow's valve, which we're going to repair. And you can see that uh, once it's repaired, it's uh, collapsed nicely. And then we can look at it with a three-dimensional echo afterwards and make sure that the repair is appropriate. So this technology is continuing to advance as well. For patients who can't have surgery, uh, this is another FDA trial that we're involved in. The mitral clip has uh, become very important in some of these patients' so care. And the clip is actually placed across the valve through the right uh, heart and across the interatrial septum. And then the valve is actually clipped so that it won't leak. This is one patient I'll just show quickly that with the, previous eight, the previous 12 months had been in the hospital eight months in congestive heart failure. He wasn't a candidate for conventional surgery. You can see all the color up here is bad. And we took the clip and we placed it across the valve. And then at that point, the clip was deployed. And once the clip is deployed, you can see now the valve is competent. And it's since then, is about uh, almost a year and a half ago now with this particular gentleman, he's not been back in the hospital and actually able to, to walk nine holes of golf. So again, a, a, uh, another example of how technology is continuing to evolve. Now really, all of, some of these things I've shown you, a lot of them are really still the square wheel of this technology. And the younger people in the audience are going to see this technology continue to advance and evolve. Coronary arteries quickly. Uh, there's two sets of coronary arteries, one on the left and, and, and one on the right. And uh, an angiogram is often performed and will demonstrate lesions or plaques, uh, which are, are uh, blockages of the coronary arteries. You can see this is a, a, a vein graft, which had been placed previously. Stents can be placed across these and dilated, so then the, the graft is open, though sometimes it is necessary because of plaque buildup and circumstances within the artery that requires bypass. So this is a vein bypass to a vessel on the right, and this is an internal mammary artery to a vessel on top of the heart, which we typically use for bypasses. This is just a, a intraoperatively uh, showing what we do when we sew a, a bypass graft onto the heart. This is a circumflex artery on the back side of the heart. And uh, we saw this was a very fine suture. You can see the artery is opened and the blockage is beyond that. So we don't take out the blockages. We go out beyond the blockages and sew the graft to the, uh, to the heart artery itself. This is the mammary artery. And again, the, it, I'm sorry for the way that this has come out green, but the, the arteriotomy is here. And so we sew that to uh, the uh, coronary artery again itself. And um, again, the good, the bad, the ugly, when you don't do what the next two speakers uh, are going to be talking about, uh, these are the things then you have to come and see someone like me. So the good news is, though, from my perspective, is we've got great technology that's continuing to evolve. 
and that uh, the new technologies uh, from our perspective would certainly require different strategies and new paradigms from previous treatment modalities because of the multi-specialty team that's uh, necessary. The time and resources necessary to be a successful program are quite significant though. All that new technology is, is extremely expensive as well as you can see all the people involved in those procedures, what's required, uh, but it is quite significant. But catheter-based treatment modalities for heart disease disorders are here to stay and will continue to evolve. And I think we'll see just incredible advancements, not only in the next 30 to 50 years, but in the next 5 to 10 years in all of these things or some of these things that, that I've just shown you briefly tonight. So again, thank you uh, for your attention and uh, I appreciate again Dr. Evans' opportunity to be here. Thank you. I'd like the people here who have reached the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro to raise their hands. Anyone here windsurfed 100 miles? Oh, who did? Okay. Is he in this room? He's in a box, a pine box somewhere. Right? Anyone here kayaked around Key West? Well, our next presenter has done just that. Jill Hamilton Buss is currently the Executive Director of Healthy Central Florida and comes to that organization from multiple nonprofits all having to do with health. Her primary mission is to help individuals and organizations make healthy lifestyle and behavior changes. She serves on Mayor Jacobs' Sustainability Task Force, on the Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Board for the City of Winter Park, and serves on the advisory boards for Orange Appeal and Edible Orlando magazines. What part of Orlando is edible? It's just, <laughs> that, that's true, that's true. She is usually hard to catch because she's usually bicycling somewhere. We had to knock her off her bicycle to get her to participate tonight. Please welcome Ms. Jill Hamilton Buss. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. I have neither performed heart surgery or watched. I couldn't even watch that video. I'm still recovering a little bit. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and to give a little context, I learned a lot from Tara's presentation and from Dr. Akala's, so I, I hope that you all have as well. But I think it's helpful to, to pause for a moment and say, how did we get here? How did we get to the chronic rates of heart disease, diabetes, obesity that we know we all have here in the United States? So by a show of hands, and it is interesting that this is the, forgive me, but this is, tends to be the younger side over here. There's a few <laughs> sprinkled around, but anyway, show of hands. How many of you walked or rode your bikes to school? A couple of young folks. Okay. So, so typically that splits along age lines. And those of us of a certain age, um, nearly 50% back in the 60s walked or rode to school. Today it's only about 13% by contrast. How many of you remember when television went dark at midnight or when there were only two or three channels? <laughs> now, the young people in the room are going, what is she talking about? Like, <laughs> what could that mean? Yes, it's true, young folks. Their television went dark, like they played the national anthem, and there were bars on the TV, and there was no TV. Again, by contrast, today there are, what, a thousand channels or something, and people are watching 24-7. So how many of you ate home-cooked meals regularly as a family? Maybe some, oh, yay, okay, so more even of our young people. And how many of you are doing that today? Okay, still a pretty good number. That's good. To, Tara's very happy about that, as is Dr. Akala. He's going to see less, less of those folks who are eating home-cooked meals, which typically have less salt and sugar. And, but many of us are eating fast food, takeout, very unhealthy diets. In fact, actually, the statistic on that one is um, less than a third are eating two nights a week together. Less, less than a third of all folks are eating together twice a week or more. Now, how many of you spent five to seven hours a day watching TV or playing video games when you were growing up? Awesome. Oh, <laughs> you're kidding me. <laughs> Some contrarians. So n nobody raised their hand, but today that is the norm, if you can believe it. And my nine-year-old son is back there, and we don't watch anywhere near that, do we, George? Not anywhere near that. No, we're barely watching any TV. He's luckily outside building forts and playing, which is what we'd love to see all kids doing because, of course, that, of course that's healthy. Some folks are calling this the end of free-range children. <laughs> we, 
you know, we're really concerned about free-range chickens, but we don't seem to be as concerned about free-range children. And I believe we ought to be, and I believe that this helps us have a conversation to say, is it okay that kids can't ride their bikes to parks and to, to school anymore? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but I don't think it is. Now, that was children that we just looked at. Quickly, for adults, the world of work in the home and outside the home has also changed. We used to have much more active work. Um, you can see her washing clothes with a manual washing machine. Our work now is very sedentary, and our home work, we have washing machines, we have riding lawnmowers, we have mixers. We have literally engineered movement out of our daily lives. And Tara talked a little bit about this, but portion sizes are so important. I really underscore what she said. We don't need bucket-sized sodas. The snacks, you go to a grocery store and the snack aisle just seems like it's taking over the grocery store. Children today, on average, are eating six snacks a day. When I was growing up, you couldn't have a snack because it was going to ruin your appetite for a real dinner, and there was going to be a vegetable on your plate. And so literally six snacks a day. So no wonder children aren't moving in school and they're eating six snacks and meals. And so therefore the obesity rate is about one third of all children. Um, adults are watching too much TV certainly and many of the, t of the commercials that they see are you know, selling them sodas and pizzas and very unhealthy fast foods. And finally our car culture. We have really built our lives around the automobile. And I don't know if you know this, but Central Florida is the most dangerous place in the nation. We are number one, sadly. More pedestrians are killed here than anywhere in the country. And we have too many high-speed roads, and even in, even in Winter Park, we have you know, lots of cut-throughs. So we have a long way to go, and this is, again, more of what Healthy Central Florida is working on. So all of those things together are going to I think they're going to surprise you. So this is a map of the United States, for, and we're starting in 1985, as you can see, and this is, we're going to look at obesity rates and a BMI of 30 or more for your, just so you can visualize, it's about 30 pounds overweight for a 5'4 person. So the white is no data, the light blue is less than 10%, and the darker blue is 10 to 14%. So let's just take a look and see what happens over the next couple of years. And hopefully my animation will work, yes. We had to add a color, 15 to 19 percent, the dark blue. Yep. We had to add a category, over 20 percent. We had to add a category, over 25 percent. Another category, over 30%. Oh, and we lost the last holdout state. That was the last date for which we, we have data, is 2010. Did anybody notice what was the holdout state? Colorado. They have been the leanest state so far, but they're, they're catching up, unfortunately. So you can see where we've been in just two and a half decades. And if we don't do something radical and fast, what do you think is going to happen? We're going to keep, keep adding colors, keep adding categories. We're going to keep getting fatter and sicker. So we've got our work cut out for us, and that is why, oh, obesity locally. I thought I'd just share this. We did some research with UCF, and the U.S. rate of obesity is 29% in our target communities, which are Winter Park, Maitland, and Eatonville. It's, it's about 26%, and here in Winter Park, it's 239 So we're beating the average ever so slightly. And that is why Florida Hospital and the Winter Park Health Foundation came together to found Healthy Central Florida, and our goal is to make our communities the healthiest in the nation. So that's a tall order, obviously, and how are we going to do that? Well, we're focusing on four areas, helping people and encouraging people to get active, to eat healthy, to be happy. Happiness actually matters, and we put stress in there. 
and breathed free. So smoking and exposure to secondhand smoke, and I'm going to say a little bit more that, about that in a minute. And again, we're focused on Winter Park, Maitland, and Eatonville now. We may expand in the future, and we work closely with Orlando and Castleberry and Orange County, but right now we're really targeting these communities. So I'm going to say a few words about some of the strategies that you can use and join us to get active and get moving, if, especially if you, if you haven't been being active. We have an online tool that you can find activities near you. You can input your zip code or your neighborhood, how much time you have, how, what your budget is, whether you want to bring your dog along, and it will give you paddle boarding, yoga, dance classes, walks, runs. So lots of fun, free things, a few low cost things, but that's a really helpful tool and thousands of people use it um, on a regular basis. So feel free to make use of that. We also lead and host weekly walks. We have a walk Monday through Friday in our three communities and also in Orlando. And we also have Walk with a Doc on Thursday nights at the Crosby YMCA, Florida Hospital Residence, and maybe we can get Dr. Akala to come and walk with us sometime, or maybe Tara. But you have access to a physician, a resident, for 45 minutes on the walk, and you can ask any questions you want about your thyroid or your pituitary or, well, I guess that's the same thing. Whatever. You can, you can talk about whatever you want. Um, and they're great doctors, and we've been um, doing that. We do that rain or shine because there's an indoor truck, track at the Crosby YMCA, so we hope you'll come out and walk with us. And I put flyers about our walks at the front, and you can also find this information online. So, again, all free, really friendly folks. They would welcome you. We also started um, two years ago, we call it the Walk 90 Challenge, and I also put pedometers. I had 50 pedometers, so there might be one for everybody out there, so please take one. And if you want to join our online walking community, I mean, you still have to go walk, but then you input your steps on, the, on our website, and it's kind of like a Facebook for walkers, um, but don't let that scare you if you don't like Facebook. It's you only put what you want, and it's, it's really fun. And the, the, you see the picture of the four women. We had a contest, a 90-day challenge. The woman in the purple shirt, the, the, next to the pink shirt, she walked almost 1,200 miles in 90 days. She's, she actually teaches a cycling class and has been for years and years and years. She lost 28 pounds walking with us in those 90, in those 90 days. And that's like walking from Key West to New York City, just for sort of perspective. But you can register at hcfwalkertracker.com, and again, all this is on our website, and we'd love to have you join us. It's been a lot of fun, and people are getting benefit. Lots of people are enjoying walking together. Some parents of school-age kids, we do a lot in the area schools. We um, promote and host walk and roll. We encourage parents, again, like I was talking about, we want more kids walking and biking to school. The research is absolutely clear. Children who've been active retain information better. They learn better. They're, they've gotten their sort of energy out. They, kids need to move. And so we, we encourage that and do that every Wednesday in our area schools. Breathe free. Um, Tara was right. It's so important. If you do smoke, we hope you'll quit. But even if you don't smoke, you are at risk when you're exposed to secondhand smoke. There is no amount of safe secondhand smoke. So we started Breathe Free, which is a, we are, we have partnered with the American Lung Association, and we're actually going around to area restaurants in Winter Park and talking to the managers and showing them the data that only 10% of Winter Park residents smoke. 10%. The, the national average was up to about 42% in the 60s. It's down to about 15% nationally, 17% in Florida, 10% in Winter Park, a little over 7 in Maitland, a little over 7% in Maitland. So that's something we can celebrate. We're actually doing well there. But we're showing that to restaurant managers and, and because you know when you're, when you're at a, a nice restaurant and somebody lights up, it can just ruin your experience if you don't smoke. In fact, even 41% of the smokers prefer smoke-free dining, if you can believe that. So we're telling them that too. So what we ask you to do is speak up. If you're someplace and you're having a meal and somebody lights up, you don't have to speak to the, the patron, but let the manager know that you would prefer a smoke-free patio and be part of our solution. We're, we're really making headway, actually. Um, and that's just a few of them who've already joined us. We also do health innovation grants. We've given out about $92,000 so far this year. We're about to have another $25,000 grant round. And we give the grants to nonprofits working in health. So if you're not part of a nonprofit, maybe you serve on a board, maybe you know somebody who you've had an idea about something that needs to be done, a crosswalk that needs to be improved. So it's policies, programs, 
permanent solutions or long-term solutions, not just a one-time event. That really doesn't, that's not evidence-based, that's not been shown to change behavior and health outcomes in the long run. So we're looking for longer-term kinds of solutions. But we're having a workshop in these four areas. You could submit a proposal, very simple reporting, really streamlined process, and we hope you'll join us at the NZN on May 28th, and I'll have more information about that on our website too. So we, we like to say that if you change the environment, you change behavior. It's very difficult to do individual behavior change through, you know, it's willpower gives out, and it's, it's hard to fit it in if you're having to just go to the gym. We're trying to incorporate it into your environment. So parking at the furthest parking spot or taking the stairs, those kinds of, you need to get more activity in your day and you need to find ways to eat healthier during the day. But if your environment supports you, if there's a healthy choice, you know, at work, if you're having a company function and there's only pizza, soda, chips, unhealthy foods, it's very difficult to make a healthy choice. If your workplace always has fruit, salads, water, fresh, fresh options available, you're much more likely to make a healthy choice. And so, and that goes for the built environment too. If there are sidewalks and bike paths, look at the West Orange Trail. It is so heavily used, the Katie Way Trail. People want to be active, they want to be healthy. And I think this video, it's very, very short, but, but I think this illustrates it just so beautifully. So, oh shoot, hold on. Let's take a look. Uh, here we go, sorry. <laughs> That's my favorite video. I just, I just love that. I think it does such a good job of illustrating what we say is that we want to make it fun. Tara said it too. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it. And so we try to make and, and engage an element of fun in everything we do. In the upper right hand corner you see our blender bike. We make fresh fruit smoothies on a bike. We had it on the fire truck yesterday in the St. Patrick's Day Parade and our giant carrots. Some of you have seen our big carrots around town. That's just a fun reminder. We take them to schools and do nutrition and healthy snack little programs and that's a reminder for kids to eat their veggies, a reminder for everybody to eat their veggies. And uh, the bottom right in the blue is our Mayor's Soul Challenge and then just community get-togethers. We really try to facilitate and bring groups together to talk about health solutions at the community level because we really can't do it alone. And I love this quote, the I in illness stands for isolation. The crucial let letters in wellness are we. It really does take a community. It takes us all working together and it's just more fun being healthy and fit together. So hope you'll join us. Glad to have you here today and there we go.
All right, our second presenter is Tara Guidis. She's co-host of the television show Emotional Moho, where she's a resident nutrition and health expert. She has a master's degree in health promotion and is a registered dietitian and is board certified as a specialist in sports dietetics. Tara is a recognized expert on nutrition, fitness, and health promotion and has been the national medium spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She has authored a number of cookbooks and has appeared on, as the Diet Diva on the national morning television show, The Buzz. Is it The Buzz? Daily Buzz. The Daily Buzz. All right. I'm, I'm not available to watch TV early in the morning. <laughs> Tara is currently the team dietitian for the Orlando Magic and is the official nutritionist for Run Disney. Please welcome Ms. Tara Guidis. All right, thank you. I'm typically not a podium speaker either, but I'm tied to it to advance my slides, so I'll try to stand here. Um, so I do not do heart surgery, but I did watch an open heart surgery once, so it's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> um, but so I'm the one that you love to hate because I'm the one who like takes away everything fun in life. Not really. Don't nod. I don't really take it away. She's like, yes, you will. Um, no. So I, I am a dietitian nutritionist, and unfortunately, heart disease is the number one cause of death in this country for men and women. And as my mother, my parents are here, told me the other day when I, when I said, oh, I'm doing a talk on, uh, on cardiovascular disease, she said, well, of course you should know about it because everyone in our line of the family dies of heart disease. <laughs> so, um, so I do care about this. It is intimate to me um, because, yes, um, everyone in my family has pretty much um, uh, gets a lot of heart disease. So uh, it's something that we all should care about. But so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the general prevention. As um, Dr. Akula said, I don't think you're the ugly, though, because, you know, I'm the one who takes away everything fun. So um, they're going to throw tomatoes at me by the end of this. But so what I'm going to do is, is give you a little bit of the general prevention tips. And specifically, as a dietitian nutritionist, I'm going to talk a lot about nutrition as we go along. So these are some of the, the biggest tips that you can hear about. And really, and they're not in any particular order, although I would say that not smoking is probably one of the best, um, and maintaining a healthy weight. And um, those two alone, if you can avoid smoking and maintain a healthy weight most of your adult life, you can do a lot to prevent heart disease. Um, then, of course, we need to move our bodies, we need to eat the right things, and um, all of those things will help to control our blood pressure and cholesterol. So when it comes to nutrition, there's a couple different sides of the nutrition equation. There's the right fats, there's sodium, and then, as I mentioned, maintaining a healthy weight. There's fiber, and I'm going to talk more specifically about all of these and getting the, that variety of foods that's going to be important. So when you hear about the right kinds of fat, and this is where nutrition gets really confusing because, as you probably have heard, and um, we do span a, a lot of ages in the room here, so on this side of the room, they weren't alive in the 1970s, but um, in the 70s, remember when, when eggs were bad and um, everything, you know, and shrimp was bad and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we've, we've evolved a lot in our nutrition knowledge over the years, and we do know that there are certain fats that we eat that do raise our blood cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and there are actually certain fats, and this has been more recent evidence, that actually can help to um, raise our good cholesterol as well. So the one that's, that's really um, agreed upon in the most part in the literature is the saturated fat that is the bad stuff. And that is the butter, high fat dairy. I'm from Wisconsin, so it kills me to say dairy. Um, but you can do low fat. You can do 1% milk, skim milk. You can do low fat cheese, um, all of that. And then some of the fattier cuts of beef. Or, or cuts of meat, I should say, because even the skin on uh, poultry and things like that. But that doesn't mean that you can't eat beef. In fact, um, the, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association does a really good job saying that there's 29 cuts of lean beef that are actually more lean than a chicken thigh without skin. 
So you, that's one of the things that I try. See, I'm, I'm a nice dietitian. You can eat steak, okay? <laughs> um, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't eat chocolate. So you can include things. It's just moderation, it's portion, it's frequency, it's all of those things. Trans fat is one that's been a little bit more recent in the literature, and that's these hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated oils. And the, the, the food manufacturers have done a really good job. I mean, even 15 years ago, there was a lot of trans fat in our food supply and then it was required so back then it wasn't required to be on the food label so this is what happens when just a small change like requiring food companies to put trans fat on a food label all of a sudden food companies completely changed how they make food because now they're transparent and you can see how much trans fat is in that food product, whereas before they didn't have to tell you. So these are some of the things that in legislation and you know, the lobbying groups and things actually do make some change when it comes to nutrition because now, um, like for example, Unilever, who owns, I can't believe it's not butter, Promise, Brummel and Brown, they own all those, Country Crock, okay, they own all four of the leading margarines. And there are zero grams of trans fat in these soft spreads in the tubs. So that was huge to be able to take out the trans fat from soft spreads. There is still some, satch, some trans fat in stick margarine. And you know, depending on the recipe you're doing, sometimes we have to use the stick. Um, but in general, if you can use the tub, that's where this whole controversy of butter versus margarine came about, is that the trans fat was in the margarine, but now you can rest assured if you use the tub, there's, they're trans fat free. And um, so that's going to be better. <clears throat> and then the dietary cholesterol is where, really where a lot of the controversy was as well. There's about, you're supposed to have about 300 milligrams or less of dietary cholesterol a day. And one egg yolk has 273. So we were told, you know, back in the 70s, don't eat eggs, eggs are bad. And now the American Heart Association has totally changed their stance and says one egg a day, I think you all know who I am now, one egg a day is actually okay on average. So you can do like one yolk a day and even eat some meat because what we found is that dietary cholesterol doesn't really raise your blood cholesterol nearly as much as the saturated fat and trans fat, if at all. So shrimp, I'm not worried about at all. Shrimp is high in dietary cholesterol, but it's so low in fat, there's virtually no saturated fat, trans fat in it. So unless you're breading it and frying it, shrimp is going to be a good thing. Or lobster. Lobster's fine, just don't dip it in drawn butter. <laughs> okay, it's the butter that's the problem. So those are some of the controversies that, that we try to fight. So this is the good news, because I don't want to be just the bad news all the time and tell you what not to eat and take away all the fun stuff. So this is the stuff that is actually good to eat. So the monounsaturated fats, I mean, look at how happy that avocado is. I mean, he's just like, woohoo, I'm, I'm hanging out, I'm good, eat me. So avocado, you know, olive oil, olives, those are all going to be good fats. But the really good news and the really exciting news um, in the world of heart health in terms of fats is um, this world of omega-3 fats. And you've probably heard, unless you've been living under a rock, about fish oil and omega-3 fats. And this is really where um, they can help lower blood triglyceride levels and they can um, help to raise your good cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol. There's also some um, evidence that shows that they help to control blood pressure. So salmon is going to be probably the most common source that most people eat. And there's different types of omega-3s that we don't have time to get into tonight. But the fish-based ones are really going to be the best for inflammation, for your brain, and for your heart. Now things like flax and nuts are going to be good too. But what you really want to focus on is the fish. And I do recommend taking 1,000 milligrams of omega-3 coming from DHA EPA, which is the fish oil omega-3s a day. So look for one of the burpless ones so you're not tasting fish oil. Um, but you know, and usually it takes about two pills, but you can look at the, um, at the package. And you know, your overall fat intake, you want to try to keep to about 20 to 35% of your calories, which based on, I don't know anyone who eats by percentages, but that's based on about uh, 78 grams of fat for a 2,000 uh, calorie diet. So sodium. So here's, here's a little bit of a soapbox for me, and this is where you might start liking me even more. So um, sodium, I just have this thing about sodium. Like if I had a totem pole of like what to do in your diet, sodium would not be near the top, believe it or not because only about a fourth of Americans are sodium sensitive to the point where it makes a clinically significant difference in your blood pressure. 
If you have high blood pressure, absolutely watch your sodium. I'm not saying unscrew the top of the salt shaker and pour it on everything, okay? But I think a lot of people really, really restrict sodium when it's not even going to amount to a hill of beans. And if you would just lose 15, 20 pounds, exercise a little bit more, that would make a huge difference in what you're doing. So in certain cases, like congestive heart failure that Dr. Akala was talking about, and in terms of, you know, some, some cases, yes, absolutely watching your sodium is going to be good. But on the other side, so you can see the recommendations here, the 2300, and if you are high risk, then it's 1500 a day. That is not much. Believe me, you are eating a bland diet if you're trying to stay to 1500 because this is not just what you're putting on. Okay, this is what's in the food that you're already eating and there's a lot of sodium added to food. Um, but the good news is that if you increase your potassium, your calcium, your magnesium, your fiber, those actually help counterbalance the effect of sodium too, and can actually help lower blood pressure. So, you know, we always hear about the bad stuff. Don't eat saturated fat, don't eat sodium, but let's talk about the good stuff. Okay, I like to talk about what to eat, not just to talk about what not to eat. So, you know, your fruits and vegetables, the nuts and seeds, there's this um, uh, diet called the DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And that's where the nuts and seeds and the fruits and vegetables and the whole grains and all of that stuff is gonna be really high. So it's not just about watching sodium, but including some of the good stuff as well. And I already mentioned maintaining a healthy weight, and I really can't emphasize this enough, just simply maintaining healthy weight, even if you eat junk. Okay, just kidding. But just maintaining a healthy weight can make a huge difference. Um, and, you know, as you gain weight, the statistics just show that your blood pressure goes up, your blood sugar goes up, your cholesterol goes up. It's not a linear line that, oh, you gain 10 pounds and automatically it goes up so many points. But we see in populations that as people gain weight, so every individual is going to be a little bit different. So what we want to try to do is really watch you know, the calories coming in versus the calories going out. And so that's where activity and exercise is going to come in to help counterbalance some of that. And what I think it really comes down to the most is not necessarily what you're eating, but how much. So you can eat anything. It's just how much are you eating. And if you can just reduce the portion, you can include everything. You can eat anything you want. Just watch how much you're doing, which of course, if it tastes really good, is hard <laughs> to do. So that's where the discipline uh, comes in. So, you know, those empty calories and things are going to make a big difference. And that's where we, you know, have the, the portion control. And um, so this is just a guide to show you, you know, if you use your hand as a guide when you're eating and eat the, the um, meat according to the palm of your hand, which is about three ounces or the size of a deck of cards, your fist is that half a cup, the fingertip is about a teaspoon, the thumb is about a tablespoon spoon, and then the clenched fist is about um, one cup, which is unfortunately a double serving of ice cream because you're only supposed to have a half cup. But anyway, so, you know, that's, if, if you were to remember anything from what I said tonight, it's portions. It's portions. So you can have ice cream, you can have french fries, you can have anything you want. It's just how much are you having? Okay. The other good news that we can eat more of when it comes to heart health is fiber. You're like, woohoo, yay, great. Okay, but fiber really does have a huge effect on your um, cholesterol. And so there's two types of fiber. There's insoluble fiber and soluble fiber. Both of them are good for the digestive tract, but soluble fiber is the one that helps to lower the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. So this is things like oats, oats bran, beans, um, beans are going to be really good. I've been known to be called the bean queen before because I recommend beans all the time to everybody. So any of those beans, whether it's the kidney beans, garbanzo beans, black-eyed peas, lentils, chickpeas, all that stuff is going to be awesome for your heart. Um, and then those fruits and vegetables. So we recommend, um, depending on age and gender and all that, but anywhere between 20 and 35 grams a day, men are going to be on the higher end, women a little bit on the lower end. And, um, you know, of course you want to be drinking lots of water to prevent constipation because even though you think, oh, you you know, fiber helps me go, but if you're not drinking enough water, then, you know, it needs to go somewhere. So um, drinking enough water is going to be good, too. I'm a dietitian. We talk about poop. Sorry. All right. So, <laughs> um, so eating a variety of foods is going to be really good, too. And, you know, I, I've listened to what people eat for many, many years, and we are creatures of habit. And so I always am encouraging people to get out of that 
um, creature of habit and eat according to the seasons. And you know, right now it's strawberry season in Florida. It might still be snowing up north, but here in Florida it's strawberry season. So you know, get your strawberries three for five dollars at Publix, or drive down to Plant City and go to the strawberry festival. So you know, there's eat according to what's going on. You know, in the seasons, not just because it's a little cheaper to buy in season fruit, but um, because it tastes better and it also gives you automatic automatic variety in your diet instead of just eating the same old apples, oranges, bananas all the time, you want to try to get different colors in your diet too, so that you're getting some of the reds, some of the oranges, some of the greens, some of the purples, and all of those give you different nutrients as well. So that's why it's nice to kind of eat from the rainbow every day. So I wanted to give you seven superfoods. First I had it as five, and then I'm like, oh wait, no, I want to add that. Oh wait, no, I want to add that. So it turned into seven. So these are my seven superfoods for heart health. So if you wanted to know, you know, what can I eat? for heart health. Salmon, as I already mentioned, is good for those omega-3s. Spinach and kale, anything green, really, is going to be fine. Broccoli, all of that, that's going to um, be really good from a carotenoid perspective. They're really good antioxidants, phytonutrients. Soy has actually been clinically proven to help lower LDL cholesterol as well. So whether you do soy milk or veggie burgers or soy nuts, edamame, any of those things are going to be really good. Um, oats, as I already mentioned, are good in soluble fiber. Berries, again, that rainbow is going to be good. The nuts or the seeds, um, nuts, seeds. Beans, I can't even get the word out. Beans and the nuts and seeds, those are all going to be good for heart health. And I mentioned the four nuts that I think are best for heart health. Um, the pistachios, walnuts, almonds, and pecans are going to be my top four nuts to choose. So yes, I know cashews are delicious, but um, they're not going to be as high in some of the nutrients that are good for heart health. Doesn't mean you can't eat them, but if you want to know the nuts for heart health, these are definitely the ones that have some really good research around them. Um, and you know, I can't not talk about exercise a little bit because. This is, you know, nutrition and exercise kind of go hand in hand. So when we talk about exercise and the heart, there are so many benefits that I can't even get into all tonight, but it really does, you know, help the heart function better and can really, it's, it's that, that whole circulatory system that Dr. Akala was talking about. And it really it has been shown to raise the good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol. It's really one of the best ways to raise your HDL cholesterol. Um, because there's not really drugs that raise your HDL cholesterol. It's omega-3s, it's exercising intensely. So it's not just bird watching, it's not just, you know, reading a magazine while you're on the treadmill, it's really huffing and puffing. You know, do some intervals, get your heart pumping a little bit, and that's going to help. Um, and, you know, the most important thing with exercise is what do you like to do? Because if you hate to run, don't run. Okay, but if you like to go play basketball or, you know, play soccer or, you know, whatever it is, go do water aerobics. Um, you can join my mom with water aerobics. Um, you know, just find what you like to do because then you're more likely to do it. So, um, so that's, I think, one of the most important things. So the American College of Sports Medicine has certain guidelines. And really, I say just do it as much as you can. Um, I want you to move at least 30 to 45 minutes, um, ideally five days a week. And if you're doing the more vigorous, this is some of the more recent research that's come out, that the more vigorous you go, the less you have to do to get the same benefits. So that's where I like the interval training and things because that can really push your heart and then you recover. And you know, you might do a three minute really hard and then recover for a minute or two and then three minutes really hard. Um, and so, you know, to really make a, a clinically significant difference in your blood pressure or your cholesterol, you do have to move for a significant amount of time and move hard move at a significant pace for what your age and gender and activity level allows, okay? So, um, you know, what, what feels somewhat hard to hard to you, okay? And then as you get more in shape, you might be able to increase and go faster and go harder and things like that. So I wanted to just kind of narrow it down to what has the most impact. If you were to do you know, anything for your heart health, I would say, as I started out with, don't smoke. That is one of the best things that you can do for your heart is to, if you are a smoker, stop yesterday. Um, but absolutely one of the best things that you can do and don't ever pick it up. And I think you already heard me say maintain a healthy weight um, quite a few times. And I'm not saying that to make anyone feel bad. It's just science. It's just science that shows that the, the, the less body fat that you have, excess body fat, I should say. I mean, of course, there's too low <laughs> as well, but most people don't have that problem. But the more excess body fat you have, 
the more risk you have, especially for your heart. And move your body. Move your body so that it, it helps with the circulation and, um, and I didn't even include a nutrition one here. So eat those seven foods that I mentioned. <laughs> and that would be a good one as well to, to give you a lot of impact. So that's all I've got for right now, but I'm looking forward to your questions because I know you've got a lot for nutrition. Okay, a good question for whomever wants to answer this. Are women more protected from heart disease because of the amount of estrogen in their bodies? Tackle that. Um, so heart disease is the number one cause of death for men and women. So um, I can't say that women are more protected because it is the number one cause of death for women as well. What you hear about is estrogen's effect on HDL cholesterol. So there is evidence that shows that um, if you are doing like hormone replacement therapy, for example, that can actually help to raise your HDL cholesterol, your good cholesterol. And women tend to just genetically have higher HDL cholesterols and they think that it's because of the estrogen effect. So women do have better good cholesterol, which does put them at slightly lower risk, but it's still killing us. So I don't know that that's really protective or not. So. I don't know. But yeah, that's where the estrogen um, idea comes from, that it's protective. I think within coronary artery disease uh, patients, uh, as women become postmenopausal, I think their risk goes up. And whether there's other contributing factors, um, uh, but I, I think that, that science definitely has demonstrated that and it probably contributes what you just said, the cholesterol, uh, the impact on cholesterol. Um, there's, here's one for Dr. Ackle, I think. At which age would you recommend women to go in for heart checkups or scans? Uh, that's a great question because a lot of the things I think that the, uh, both the other speakers discussed, whether uh, people, people are, there we go, how's that? People are obese. I should know how to do that. My daughter is. But people are obese, uh, diabetes, some of the other disease processes that can potentiate uh, coronary artery disease. And, and we always, and none of us uh, really spoke about genetics, uh, which is an, a huge impact. You can do everything right that, that the two previous spoke, speakers have discussed and, um, and eat all the beans that you like. And if you, and, but you can't, you can pick your beans, but you can't pick your parents, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, you know, there's a lot of factors. And patients ask me, and I tell them the equation has a number of variables. Um, in the equation which then results in heart disease and many of these we can control and can influence um, uh, but I think that uh, overall uh, the question regards to when should a woman begin having uh, uh, checkups and I think that along with their their normal uh, female checkups uh, as they become postmenopausal I think it's more important for them to to at that point uh, begin having some type of cardiovascular evaluation and the American Heart Association lists the age 45 for men and the age 55 for women as, eight, as uh, that's the, the magic age that, that your age becomes a risk factor for heart disease. So if I were to say anything, I would say at least 55, if not before, if you have a strong family history, then maybe sooner. Or if, you're, um, if you have any symptoms, obviously, you would get it checked out. Yeah, Dr. Evans, I would just add that related to heart disease is diabetes. And oftentimes that can be asymptomatic for a long time. So make sure that you're getting checked for diabetes, especially as you start to get up 45, 50, if it's in your history. Even if you have a great diet, even if you're very active, which are two mitigating factors, but diabetes really is, is creeping up, so. Okay, good, I have a, one here from probably for Tara or Jill. What do you think would be the most beneficial, beneficial change in someone's day-to-day -day activities that could prevent uh, heart disease later on? Put down the fork. <laughs> Whoa, that's a little dramatic. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think portion size as it's related to um, eating too much, which is then related to healthy weight. I think maintaining a healthy weight is is the number one thing that you can do to maintain your, uh, to reduce your risk of heart disease. And by that, I mean body fat, of course. I would actually agree with that, but certainly second to that, you know, getting active. Wherever you're starting, whatever your baseline is, if you're sitting on the couch and you haven't been active in 20 years or forever, you know, just begin by a walking program. That's sort of the gateway activity to being more active. And it's low stress or swim, certainly. So I would say those two things as well. 
Yeah. Um, this one, maybe Dr. Akala can address this. Do people with heart murmurs have an increased risk for heart disease? You might explain what a murmur is. And yeah, heart murmur, when we discussed, when we talked about uh, aortic stenosis, where there's uh, a decreased orifice, and so the heart has to pump the same amount of blood, which should be through an orifice the size of a quarter, but instead of, uh, is an orifice the size of a lima bean, it creates turbulent flow, and that's when a physician puts a stethoscope on your chest and hears a <laughs> that type of a sound. It's from the, the uh, disturbed flow across the valve. So uh, the valvular disease in and of itself is a form of heart disease. It doesn't precipitate or cause coronary artery disease per se, um, but some of the same factors, I think, that the cholesterol and some of the inflammatory factors that occur within our diets can precipitate increased or progression or more rapid progression of valvular disease. So I think the same things that, that Jill and Tart spoke about are, are important. But valvular disease uh, is a disease of the aging, uh, and it's, it's oftentimes can be genetic as well. Uh, so, uh, but again, the same thing to avoid the, the, um, the problems with valvular disease it comes from the same thing that has been discussed, not only appropriate diet, but getting out and exercising. So one doesn't cause the other, but they, they can uh, be uh, in the, the patient at the same time and be additive. Great. Um, this is a really good question. We, a couple of speakers mentioned healthy weight. Um, the question is, how do you gauge healthy weight? And anybody can take on that that would like to. I don't know. I think jump in front of the mirror and time it when it, <laughs> when it stops shaking. Is that a. I'm just saying, I grew up in the Midwest. Things were very simple there. I don't know. What to, <clears throat> no, I'm going to pass that That's to them. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, there is a quote, ideal body weight for everybody. And it actually doesn't change as you age, believe it or not. Um, you're supposed to still maintain that same weight um, your entire adult life. So for men, it's actually kind of easy to, to figure out. Well, let me start with women first. So for women, it's 100 pounds for the first five feet. Then you add five pounds for every inch you are above five feet. So if you're five six, your ideal body weight, quote unquote ideal, is 130 pounds, plus or minus 10%. So if you're a very small frame size, so if you can take your fingers and wrap them around your wrist and they overlap, then you're a small frame size. If they touch comfortably, you're a medium frame size. And if they don't touch at all, you're a larger frame size. So that greater than 10% would be for large frame size. The under 10% would be for the smaller frame size. But if you're anywhere in that plus or minus 10%, that would be good, okay? So ideal weight is 100 pounds for every, uh, for five foot. For a woman, five pounds for every inch above uh, five foot, okay? For men, it's very similar, but it's, you start at 106 for five foot, and you add six pounds for every inch above, okay? So I can't do that as easy in my head. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're, and, and again, it's that plus or minus 10% um, for frame size. What about people who have more muscle mass as opposed to, is the body right. weight really a true uh, indicator yeah, of it, someone's overweight? Yeah, good point. So, and that's what I hate about BMI, the body mass index that you hear about. And that was what, you know, we, we see that. And, and BMI is perfect for what Jill presented with those shocking um, states where you see that. It's great for populations. So when you look at a population, if we were to take everybody's height and weight and, and look in the room here, but for an individual, um, you know, I've never, so they say, you know, 25 or less is good, 27 is overweight, 30 is obese and all that. Well, for women, it, but it's the same for men and women. Whereas women, you know, I've never really seen a woman who's really that happy at a 25, but yet that's okay. And a man who's at a 25 is pretty lean. So it's okay for populations to look at that, but it's really body fat percentage that puts you at risk. So the number on the scale, depending on your, your, your muscle mass, is really going to be um, an indicator. So someone that's really, really muscular might appear, quote, obese, but if you did their body fat percentage, they may be perfectly fine in that body fat percentage. Most people, weight is a good indicator though, most people aren't overly muscular and that's their problem. <laughs> yeah, no, well said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a question since we have ladies, you know, two thirds of the 
panel are ladies here. I, I, it's my understanding that a woman size four or size six or size eight has changed over the decades also. Is that not true? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the clothing I mean, us size. guys, everything is related to the inches, so we, we, right. we can't escape. I know, but, exactly. You know. Well, and that's one, of, but that's one of the things that I will ask men. You know, if they'll say, oh, I weigh the same I did in college. And I'm like, oh, that's great, but do you wear the same pant size? <laughs> well, no. Well, okay, so if you're the same weight, if you're 180 pounds or 200 pounds or whatever you were in college, but yet, yeah, I call it the furniture phenomenon. Have you heard this joke before? So, you know, for men, this works more for men than women. Um, <laughs> you, you carry the weight more in your, you know, in your chest and your upper body shoulders when you're, you know, younger. And then as you age, it moves to your drawers. <laughs> Get it? Furniture. Okay. So, so that's what happens is you might weigh the same on the scale, but as you gain fat and lose muscle, you know, you're, you're going to gain it most of the time, especially for men around the middle, and so your waist size increases. But yeah, that's the way to, to rope women in, is, you know, you go and you try on clothes, and you're like, wow, I used to be an eight, but this six fits, so I'm going to buy it, because <laughs> it makes you feel good. So yeah, the clothing sizes have definitely changed. I don't guess either of you have to worry about it one way or the other. Um, okay, this, uh, apparently we have some Rollins athletes in the audience, and this one specifically is directed at Tara, but... I think the rest of you could pipe in. This, I have to read this question because it's kind of cool. A nutritionist told my teammates and I that as female athletes, we should be intaking about 8,000 to 10,000 calories per day. <laughs> Needless to say, he lost credibility with us. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is cute. If anyone wants to identify themselves. Swimming. Swimming, OK. okay. Um, what type it's of foods do you recommend phenomenon. before a high cardio workout and, and anything that helps give our heart a boost during a workout or training? What was the last part of the question, sorry? Um, or is there anything, um, what do you recommend before a high cardio workout and anything that helps gives your heart a boost during a workout? Okay. Is there anything that helps give your heart a boost during a workout? Okay, so can I address the whole calorie thing? So, you know, back, what Olympics was that? That was like a while ago. Yeah, the whole Michael Phelps thing. I think that was like 98. Um, and there were all these news reports of, of Michael Phelps eating, you know, 8,000 calories, whatever. Okay, I find that really hard to believe because if he eats 8,000 calories, he is sinking in the pool, okay? Um, I mean, maybe, because he's, he's a sprint swimmer as well. So if you're doing, he's not a sprint swimmer? He's a flyer. He's a flyer, well, whatever. He's not, he's not out there for three hours like a marathoner, right? I mean, you're, you're doing more like, I mean, his, his events last between 30 seconds to three minutes to four minutes, okay? Not like a marathoner who's out there for three hours, okay? So that's what I meant. It's more of a sprint distance versus like a longer, you know, distance. So um, anyway, so, okay, so I'm, uh, I, you know, I'm not shy. I'm 5'6", about 120 pounds. I exercise quite a bit. I eat about 2,200 calories a day to maintain my weight, okay? I work with the Orlando Magic. These guys are 6'8", <laughs> okay, 6'9", they're 265 pounds, 4% body fat. Those guys, and they exercise for a living, and I've, I watch practices all the time. These guys work, okay? <laughs> um, and those guys eat maybe 6,000, 7,000 calories a day. So you girls, no, you're not eating eight to 10,000 calories a day, all right? So believe it or not, though, I have a little trivia for you. So, okay, so if an Orlando Magic player is 265 pounds, 4% body fat, you know, lean, mean machine, exercising, you know, very hard or vigorous, um, for several hours a day, and they're eating 7,000 calories a day. Think about a sumo wrestler, okay? So let's think about a totally different kind of athlete, all right? So a sumo wrestler is what? Fat. Fat, thank you. So, and they, they, so these guys are 400 pounds, 450 pounds. How many calories do you think a sumo wrestler eats? 10,000, 12,000? 16,000. Okay, it's actually a trick question because it's how does a sumo wrestler eat? The average sumo wrestler actually only eats about 3,700 calories a day, which is not that much for a 400 pound person. But what a sumo wrestler does is he doesn't eat. So he doesn't eat all day and then he goes to town and eats 3,500, 3,600 calories in a sitting, which is a lot of food in one sitting. But what the, the not eating trains his body to starve so that he will get fat. So anyone who wants to have the body of a sumo wrestler, anyone? <laughs> um, don't eat. Okay, so my chronic dieters that come to see me, I'm like, and, and they're eating 1,200 calories and they still can't lose weight. I'm like, I believe you. 
because you've trained your body to starve. And now, when you do eat, your body's like, hallelujah, I got some food. <laughs> Let me put it on. And then it tries to, you know, hang on. Okay, so that's how we get fat is by not eating. So the goal, so when I say I can't answer that question, like how many calories do you need? Because it depends on when you're eating it. So I eat six, seven, eight times. I eat five times before noon. No joke, okay? I eat a thousand of my calories way, like by 11. I get up at 4.30 every day. But so, you know, a lot of my calories are earlier in the day. And so when you, when you, if, you, if you eat all your calories in one sitting, you can't eat as much. But when you spread them out throughout the day, it's that furnace, it's that spreading it out, it's that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, that kind of stuff. That's the nutrition stuff that you hear, okay? I'm giving a really long-winded answer, Dr. Evans. I'm sorry. Um, so the, the, but the other question was, what should we eat before a workout? Okay, so absolutely before exercise, what you want to focus on is carbohydrates the most because carbohydrates are your body's preferred source of energy, and that's what your body will use up the most quickly. So depending on what time of the day the workout is, if it's first thing in the morning, you're probably not going to eat a ton, but, you know, I, I work out first thing in the morning, and I'll just, you know, eat some dry cereal. I might have a banana. I'll drink some water, and boom, I'm working out, and then I come back and have breakfast. If it's later on in the day, you might eat, you know, an hour or two before the workout because it has a little bit of time to digest. So, you know, anything, so fruit is always good, anything carbohydrate. So you might do, um, you know, that granola bar or, you know, cereal or toast or anything like that that's going to be um, carbohydrates is going to be good. And then after exercise, again, carbohydrates within 30 minutes and then the protein within two hours is going to be key. Okay. We know what they need to do now. We've got to win this season. <laughs> All right. Uh, this question for Dr. Aqua. Have doctors started to merge nutrition and alternative medicines in addition to surgical intervention to improve heart health? Um. I mean, that's a very good question. I wouldn't say they've started to. I think it, uh, I mean, I think medicine began with um, a holistic type of measures and then developed into, of course, the, the, the uh, bacteria theories and then the development of antibiotics and things that, that and then surgical procedures. Uh, but I think that uh, the, um, the holistic medicine has been around since the beginning of time because obviously we didn't have headlights and, and uh, operating room theaters back then and, and herbs and various uh, uh, things were, were utilized as medicines. I think there has been a return back to some of the uh, Eastern medicines and, and some of those, uh, um, those thought processes or cultures because, I, and certainly there, there's something to that. I mean, people have been doing those for thousands of years. And I, in, in my practice, I see patients do that, whether it's supplements or various other uh, types of, of herbs or, or entities. But I think that they can be complementary. I think what I would stress is if you do take uh, various herbs or cat's claw or ginseng or whatever it is you take, you let your physician know, particularly if you're going to have surgery, because many of those things cause uh, patients to bleed easier. Vitamin E, uh, a lot of those uh, the supplements that, that we consider as well, they're not true medications. They, they really are. So the important thing, I think, is, is if you practice something like that, first of all, understand it. But second of all, if you do require a surgical procedure or an alteration of your medications from a physician, make sure you let them know what you're taking because they may have an impact. And, and you might not think of them as a medication when your doctor asks you. So be sure that you mention any alternative methodologies. Um, there's a good question here, and, and uh, it goes to some policy issues, maybe, and what we can do. We, know, we do know that uh, obesity is kind of uh, running rampant now in our adolescent child community. Um, and along with that, our diagnosis of type 2 diabetes has gone up significantly in adolescent kids. So what can public health, what can public schools do to prevent heart disease and promote good health from an early age in our children? I think it's a great question. It's a great question. And luckily, here in Central Florida, we are actually, Orange County Public Schools has done a great job of getting friars out of the schools. All the sodas are now out of schools, and they're really looking at 
increasing and encouraging vegetable consumption. I know there was the pizza as a vegetable flap recently, and you know it's not perfect, but they're moving in the right direction. And actually, the Winter Park Health Foundation has funded for, gosh, 10 years now, healthy school teams in our area schools, the Winter Park Consortium Schools, and those are teachers who get a slight pay increase, a, a stipend, to conduct healthy school team activities. And now the state is going to be rolling that out um, countywide and probably statewide, and that's, that's awesome. Um, and so they get it, they understand, but a lot of the, lot of the school systems, the food program is self-funding. And so those, you know, you might have a healthy lunch with more vegetables, but there's also bake sales going on and, and unhealthy foods being sold to supplement the budget. And so it's, it's every avenue, like blocking the entrances and keeping the bad stuff out. And those are the kinds of discussions that we're having at Healthy Central Florida with the healthy school teams that the foundation is, that OCPS is. So people are aware and they're working on it, but it's how do you, how do you counteract the budget challenges that they have. So. Jill, back at that one thing, um, another innovation that's kind of taken off in the Orange County public school system is the walking classrooms. Mm -hmm. So they have actually lessons recorded on, um, you know, uh, like an iPod kind of device, and they go outside and they walk while they're learning. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a wonderful program, but again, that feeds into everything you've already mentioned. And I just wanted to mention, too, that while schools are important, so is home. And, you know, we're always encouraging parents to be that role model of activity and of healthy eating. And I had a, a patient, this was a few years ago, I had a client who was, um, he was like a 16-year-old boy. And I was talking about eating blueberries. And he's like, I've never had a blueberry. I mean, I just, my jaw. I was like, I'm sorry, what, what? He goes, well, I've had a blueberry muffin. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I was just like flabbergasted. So, you know, parents just think that their kids are going to automatically like love broccoli. And if you've never had it or you don't have it on a regular basis at home, they're not going to like turn 18 and go, whoa, broccoli, where have you been my whole life? So, you know, we have to be encouraging the, uh, the parents to role model. And you also can't, you know, not eat the broccoli yourself and expect your kids to do it um, or send them out to play when they don't see you um, acting. I mean, my kids know if they wake up between 5 and 6 a.m., I am in my exercise room in the garage <laughs> doing my exercise. I mean, they know exactly where I am, when, and they see me exercising all the time, and so they know that that is part of a healthy lifestyle. Well, Jill Hamilton Buss, Tara Guidis, Dr. Kevin Akala, thank you so much for serving as our panelists and giving a great presentation tonight. Thank you. Um,